you for visiting our YouTube channel. We hope that the message that you're viewing will be an encouragement, helpful, and a blessing. If you'd like to get additional information about Temple Baptist Church, please visit our website at templebaptch.com. You may also reach us by email at moreinfo at templebaptch.com. Thank you again for watching, and please consider subscribing to our channel to view new messages as they're made available. chapter number 8. Uh, we're continuing our study here in the book of 1 Samuel, and um, we're going to begin reading in verse 1 of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now understand, let me give you some background here. The Ark of the Covenant was now out of the enemy's hands. We looked at that last week, and it's resting in the house of Abinadad. And uh, uh, we kind of jumped ahead a little bit last week when David sent the people to go and retrieve the ark out of the home of Abinadab and how that Ohio put forth his hands, or Yuza rather, put forth his hands and steadied the ark when the uh, ark began to shake on the new cart, and of course he lost his life. Uh, but Shiloh had been destroyed by the Philistines and was no longer the location of the sanctuary of the Lord. And many years would pass before the ark would again be moved to Jerusalem by David and again you can read that account over in chapter 15 of 1 Chronicles. But having the ark in Jerusalem didn't automatically solve Israel's problems. As we looked last week, in the mind of Yuza, the ark had become an object instead of a representation of the Lord. Anytime God becomes an object in our mind, we're in trouble. I, I personally believe that's where we're at in this nation today. We have stamped on our currency and God we trust, but we don't trust the God of the currency. We trust the currency God's placed his, or we've stamped God's name on. And um, again, God has become a crutch for most in this country today, uh, only uh, consulted when crisis hits. And, uh, but again, this was not going to solve the problem because during that 20 years while the ark was in Abinadab's home, a new generation of uh, people arose and they were crying out for radical change in Israel's government. Sounds similar, does it not? Uh, we've heard recently, since this election has taken place, go to Georgia and we'll change the nation. Uh, we're hearing that. By the way, you need to pray about that upcoming runoff election. Uh, there's many things that uh, could happen as a result of that. But up until now, the people of Israel had looked to God as their king, as their leader. Uh, but now they have asked the Lord to give them a king just like other nations. It's been said that looking at others will often result in undesirable results. Let me repeat that. Looking at others uh, will often result in undesirable results. Someone has also said, be careful what you ask for, you may just get it. And uh, that was the case with Israel. Now we're going to begin reading here in verse 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 8. And the Bible says, and it came to pass when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. By the way, he should have never done that. His sons were heathens. Uh, they were reprobate. Uh, they, they certainly didn't love the Lord. They didn't follow the Lord. The Bible goes on to say in verse 2, Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in, the way, in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and, it came, to, and came to Samuel unto Ramah. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in, the, in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. 
For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, uh, that I should not reign over them. I want you to note there, if you would, verses 6 and 7. These words give us a king to judge us. And in verse 7, again, we read these words. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have rejected, they have not, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should uh, not reign over them. Note those words there again in verse number six, give us a king. Again, we read those in verse five as well, make us a king to judge us. Now, again, be careful what you ask for, you may get it. That's exactly what happened here. The children of Israel decided they would be far better served to have a, a, a human, a king, a, a human king to rule over them more so than God. And so as we begin to consider this, uh, I want us to uh, think here about uh, some of these things that transpired. Notice if you would here, the seeking, uh, the, the seeking of the Lord. Samuel knew that the people were restless. And uh, we're, we're not going to go back and read this, but uh, we'll read part of it over in chapter 7. Samuel knew that the people were restless. And he understood they were wanting change. He knew that times, and, uh, times of transition uh, bring out either the best or the worst of people. We see that happening right now. That's why some are looting buildings and burning buildings and, um, and uh, taking advantage of individuals. Times of transition either bring the best or the worst out in people. Samuel knew one thing, king or no king, the nation could never succeed if the people didn't put the Lord first and trust the Lord only. That's why he called for a meeting in Mizpah back in chapter 7 there, and he challenged the people to return back to the Lord. Uh, he challenged them to remove their false gods, their idols. Notice, if you would, in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 7. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, and put away the strange gods, and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines, then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth, and serve the Lord only. And so we see here this challenge. He said, uh, you, you, you need to do away with these false idols. Uh, destroy them. Not only do we see here they remove their false gods, but also they confess their sin. That was a good thing. Again, in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 7, Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord. And fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. And so we see here really a first step of revival here. Uh, they they, they were destroyed their idols. They confessed their sin. And then we see here they prayed for God's help. In verse 7, And when, Phil, when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, the Lord of the Philistines went up against Israel, and when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. The children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offered uh, up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to the, to the battle again, against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under beth -car. And then in verse 13 and 14, so the Philistines were subdued and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron even unto Gath, and the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hand of the Philistines, and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And so we see here, again, as we uh, see this challenge here, Samuel challenged the people to seek the Lord. Now, let me say this this morning, that same challenge is very appropriate for us today. 
We are a nation for the most part who has turned our back upon God. So I said a moment ago, we use God as a crutch sadly today. When disaster strikes or tragedy hits, that's the only time many people even consider there's a God in heaven. And they flippantly say, well, we need to pray when they never pray any other time. And so we see here the challenge. But I want you to note secondly here the rejection of the Lord. Uh, as we read here, as we began reading here in verse 1 of chapter 8. Now it was probably 20 or 25 years uh, between the events of chapter 7 and what we read about here in chapter 8. Samuel was now an old man. He's about to pass from the scene. A new generation had emerged with new leaders who had new ideas. By the way, if it's not broke, don't try to fix it. Uh, we see that happening all over our country today. Churches coming up with new ideas and new programs and new promotions and uh, trying to attract a crowd. By the way, if a church is a people-centered church, it's destined for failure. What do I mean? We need to be a Christ-centered church, not a people-centered church. If we're a people-centered church or if a church is a people-centered church, that church will do anything to attract a crowd and to maintain a certain degree of happiness amongst, amongst the people. But uh, this new generation comes along and they decide they want to do things a little differently. Life goes on and the circumstances change and God's people uh, must have wisdom to adapt to new challenges without abandoning old convictions. Uh, we're facing a challenge today that we've never faced in churches at least in my lifetime. It's amazing uh, what's happening in this nation. You say, well, do you doubt the virus? I don't doubt the virus at all. I saw a patient pass with it on Tuesday. It's, it's a real thing. But this nation has been brought to, its, uh, to a standstill out of fear. The truth of the matter is, for that patient that died on Tuesday, there's probably 25 or 30 or maybe even 50 people that survived it. Most people survived the virus. Oh, but there are people walking around scared to death as if the sky is falling. We've been brought to a, a, a place of fear. And churches, are, sadly, are suffering because of it. There are some in leadership roles in this nation who've made it difficult for churches. There are some in leadership roles, representative roles. Let me change what I just said. They're not leaders, sadly. But they represent people who are now making it difficult for folks for Thanksgiving. Do you realize many of these who are in authority positions and uh, representative positions, do you realize it's a direct attack upon all the institutions that God established? The first institution was the home. When do most people get together? Thanksgiving, we normally sit around a table. We normally uh, have prayer together. We enjoy a meal together. We talk to one another. We spend time with our families. It's a direct attack upon the home. It's a direct attack upon the government. Uh, again, uh, you don't have to look long and you don't have to look hard to see that there was corruption in this election. You say that's not been proven. I don't need proof. But it has been proven. Uh, when you find boxes of ballots that were stuffed somewhere that did not get counted, that's corruption. When software begins to tweak the way the results are coming in, that's corruption. Uh, you say, you shouldn't say that. You'll get banned on Facebook. Ban us. I don't care. It's amazing to me today, anytime anybody posts something regarding the election, they flag that with, see the true election results. I don't want Facebook's opinion. Zuckerberg has zero clue about most things. He's counting his money, but he has no sense at all. You say, well, they'll cut you off. Cut us off. I don't care. You can take my tax exemption. I don't care about that either. We don't buy enough around here for that to matter. Amen. But it's a tack up on the government. And thirdly, it's an attack upon the church. 
When a government says a church cannot meet or limits the number of people that can come into a building or says you cannot sing or we're going to fine you, they've overstepped their authority. That's why the First Amendment's on the front door of our building. And the first one that comes in here that wants to stir up some trouble, they'll be escorted out of here. I don't jump in the YMCA's pool because I'm not a member there. And you come in here with a clipboard wanting to stir up some trouble. If you're not a member here, you're going to be asked to leave and you've refused to leave. We'll have you arrested for trespassing. You say you ought not say things like that. I hope every one of them's watching. I was talking to one of our county administrators yesterday. And I'm grateful there's some good folks that still serve. And uh, we were discussing some of these things. Do you realize until somebody stands up against the tyranny that they're going to continue to push? Somebody's going to have to take a stand. Somebody's going to have to fight the fight. Somebody's probably going to have to pay a price. But they begin to ask for a king. And it's interesting as we think about this, the logic behind it. Notice what, what is said here in verses 1 through 5. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in the ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Doesn't that sound familiar? Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now the people here requested a king because Samuel was old, his sons were corrupt, and the surrounding nations had kings. However, when they asked for a king, notice how they label that like other nations. The children of Israel were never like other nations. They were God's chosen people. God had made a covenant with Abraham. He promised to bless them. He promised to bless those that blessed them and curse those that cursed them. They were not like every other nation. However, when they begged and pleaded for a king, they said, give us a king like other nations. They were forgetting that their strength was to be unlike the other nations. Not only do we see their logic, but we also see here their lamentation. Notice verses 6 through 9. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Now Samuel was a man that had some spiritual insight, but he also had some lapses when it came to that. He should have never put his sons in charge like that. But he did have some spiritual insight and he knew that this demand for a king was evidence of spiritual decline and spiritual decay among the people. By the way, it was evident in his home too. He, again, should have never put those two sons as judges. Uh, but again, the Lord reminded him they were not rejecting him, they were rejecting God. That leads us to consider as we think about this, their liability. Notice what it says in verse 10. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be horsemen. And, and some shall run before his chariots. In other words, he's going to draft them for his military. They don't have any choice. It's not a voluntary thing. He's going to draft your sons to be in the military. They're going, to, they're going to be in front of his chariot, they're going to be alongside his chariot, and they're going to be behind his chariot. Go, it goes on to say in verse 12, and he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set 
them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. Boy, this, doesn't this sound so familiar today? I mean, our government's seizing property they have no right to. That's exactly what Samuel told the people was going to happen. Again, verse 15, he will take the tenth of your seed and your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. He will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and you shall be his servants. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall, shall have cho uh, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Now Samuel was very direct; he was very clear as to what the king would do. Now you would have thought that would have put the brakes on. I mean, had I known what I know today uh, was going to transpire a couple of weeks ago as a result of this election. I, I may have even said more. But notice what it says here in verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. Now again, Samuel explains the consequences of allowing a king to rule over them instead of God. He said he's going to force military service upon your sons. He's going to force you to serve him Basically, it's slave labor. He's going he's to tax you. And in spite of all the warnings, they still demanded a king. Uh, things haven't changed much in this day in which we're living. We want everything every other nation has. I personally believe God has blessed this country well beyond understanding. This nation has had God's provisions and God's blessings for a number of years. And yet this nation, for the most part, has turned its back upon God. We want what everybody else has. And God says, okay, you want it, you can have it. I believe we are reaping the results of some of the things that many desired many years ago. When our country said that young children can no longer pray in school, God said, okay, you can have it. You don't want me, then you're, you're destined to your own devices. When our nation said the Bible could no longer be read in a classroom, I believe we're reaping the results of that today. Not long after that, our nation said that it was legal to take the child from the womb of a woman with no consequences to a doctor at all. We're reaping the results of that. A few years ago, our nation said it was okay for two men or two women to be united in matrimony. God says, okay, you want that? Have at it. We have more diseases on the face of the earth today than ever before. We have zero cure for many of them. Zero. God says, okay, you want to do your own thing? Go ahead. Be careful what you ask for. You may just get it. When we asked God to leave the premises of the schoolroom years ago, and we wonder why there are now shootings in classrooms. Could it be God gave us what we wanted? Could it be we said to God, we don't want you to rule us. Give us a king. Give us a king. Like all the other nations, give us a king. 
And God says, fine. You want it, you can have it. Our nation's in a mess today. It's in a mess today. You say, well, this ele the election's not going to fix nothing. Certainly the individual that we wanted in office, it doesn't look like that's going to happen unless some miracle happens. And then you talk about chaos after it's already been called and it gets overturned. You talk about war. We're headed there. We're in a mess today. The White House is not going to fix it. You say, well, if you can just educate people to a better degree and give them better work skills and better ability and opportunity, that's not going to fix it either. Because we've removed God out of his proper place. And until God's placed back in that position of priority or preeminence, we're going to continue to struggle and we're going to continue to have issues in this land. I'm grateful for some of the decisions that was made. Our president's not perfect. Matter of fact, his moral compass is, uh, certainly wouldn't line up with ours. But I think he's been good for this nation. I think he's helped churches. I think he's helped some other things. I don't know what the future holds. God does. But I don't know what the future holds, but I know this. Be careful what you ask for, because God may just say, okay, you want it, have at it. The children of Israel said, give us a king. We don't want God ruling over us. We don't want a, 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 a prophet or a priest, a high priest ruling over us. We want a king. God said, okay, Samuel, you hearken to the words. I'll give them what they want. And as we'll see in the days ahead, it cost them tremendously. It cost them tremendously. By the way, it's still costing them some of the uproar and un, uh, unrest in that, in that part of the world was a direct result of some of these decisions. And we're still paying the price today. Again, they said, give us a king. God said to Samuel, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. And any time a nation or an individual rejects God, they're destined for doom.